What I want to start with today is, um, is a discussion of ethical theory. And uh, let me describe ethical theory first to you as an attempt to answer the question, what is it that makes right things right and wrong things wrong? Um, Lots of different ways uh, to put that. You can also ask, what is it that uh, serves as the foundation of morality? That's another way of saying just about the same thing um, in fancier terms. But if you think of it as basically the, the question of what makes, what makes the difference between right and wrong, what is it that m makes some things right and some things wrong, uh, you'll if you think of it that way, you'll have your um, uh, attention focused on what's probably the most important question in theoretical que ethics. Now what I'd like you to do is just sort of reflect on this. Uh, think about your own views about right and wrong. Think about other people's views or claims concerning right and wrong. And uh, without uh, getting too fancy about it, what is it that you think? I mean, what would you say is it there might be a variety of different sorts of answers. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to entertain as many as I possibly can in a short period of time, at least to get started. What is it that serves as the basis of right and wrong? What is it that makes some things right and other things wrong? Yeah? It sounds kind of hokey, but treating people the way you would like to be treated after my mind. Okay, so let me, let me jot that down. And do you mind if I abbreviate that, the golden rule? Okay. So that's the first thing. I mean, but that, 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 that's a suggestion as to what, I mean, remember the question was, what is it that makes some things right and some things wrong? And the answer is, I guess, that some things do and some things do not conform with this particular principle, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that what you had in mind? Mm -hmm. But let me repeat the question in a slightly different way. What makes that right? I presume that that's something that's right. You should do unto others, I mean in your view, you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What is it that makes that right? Um, I, I don't think that's right because it's what you may You can speak louder so that... Okay. Oh, I don't think that's right because what you may think is right for you, another person so you shouldn't, you, you, you shouldn't do unto others the way you would have them do unto you, at least at some level, because, in your view, because uh, after all, they may not want to be treated the way you want to be treated. Right? Is that the point? How would you answer that? Now, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting point about the golden rule. Yes? Um, well, I think every person wants to be treated with respect and in a nice way. And if, you know, if you're going to treat someone rude, then I wouldn't want someone to treat me rude, so why would I have that way towards someone else? Unless they gave me a reason. Well, what if you did like to be treated rudely? Should you treat other people rudely? No. And we could do this at a variety of different levels of abstraction. And I'm not sure whether that's a, that's a, 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 a familiar expression, this business is about differentiating between levels of abstraction. But some things are, some ways of putting the golden rule, or understanding it, I should say, some way of understanding the golden rule are more concrete than others. The spirit of the golden rule is that you should uh, treat people in, um, in, uh, as considerately of their likes and dislikes as you would like to be uh, uh, treated are considered in terms of your likes and dislikes. So that, for example, um, you might want people to treat you uh, in a certain, with a certain degree of familiarity, and other people might not like to be treated with that same degree of familiarity. Uh, the golden rule wouldn't say, treat everybody with the same degree of familiarity. It would say, have the same consideration for other people and the way that they want to be treated as you would like them to have with regard to you. So it, you have to be cautious with principles like the golden rule. Uh, if it's to have any plausibility at all, it's going to be at the, at the right level of abstraction. We have to be careful not to do this too, su at, at too superficial level. At a deeper level, perhaps it's plausible. But again, I repeat my question. The real question before us is not uh, uh, <coughs> specifically whether the golden rule is correct 
is a correct principle of morality. The question is a little bit more abstract. It's theoretical. Whether it's right or not, what is it that makes right things right? If it's right, if this is correct, if we should treat people uh, in the same way at some level of abstraction as we would like to be treated ourselves, what is it that makes that right? Society. I didn't hear that. that was, I heard it. Society says so. Okay, so let me just offer number two, social um, acceptance is one thing to say. I'm going to put something else with a slash on it uh, as something a little bit harder that uh, it might be required. Social acceptance or even in some cases command. That's one of the things that people offer as a candidate for a determining principle of the rightness or wrongness of actions. Now, right now, without much, I'm not, without critique, I'm interested in anything else that someone might think of as uh, being um, lying at the basis of right and wrong. Parental views. I'm sorry, louder. Parental views. Parental views, in particular. Do, does the, do, do the views of parents count more in making things right or wrong than the views of anybody else? I think what you have in mind is that, uh, that parents play a, a, an important role in, uh, in bringing it about that, uh, that children have certain ethical views. What's intriguing is that sometimes children have the same or something like the same ethical views as their parents, and sometimes children don't seem to be to have the same ethical views as their parents, and it's not consistently because the parents were or were not active in their lives. I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of different, there's an interesting dynamic between parents and children. Um, sometimes what, uh, you, know, you know, let's just presume cases where parents are very much concerned that their children uh, think about things in the right way and behave ethically, and let's also just isolate our attention on cases where parents devote a great deal of attention to trying to inculcate or promote or uh, uh, help guide the right kinds of beliefs in their children. Just looking at those cases, I think you'll find that sometimes the, the, the inculcation or the guidance is successful and sometimes it's not quite apart from, you know, examining which particular beliefs are being inculcated. But I don't know whether, do you really want to say that, I mean, that, that, that has to do with the formation of belief, but is that what makes things right or wrong? No, I just feel that um, society, well, when you're, when you're children, your parents impose what is right and wrong. Like, you don't touch a hot stove, but yet, you know, you can play this, this you know. They impose certain limits on you of what is right and wrong, and then as you get older, society has a greater impact on you. How about if I just say Change. other authorities, uh, the command of other authorities? Um, and then I'll urging or command. I mean, varying degrees of strength in the uh, ways in which the, the, the beliefs or wishes of the authorities might be made known to people. Uh, I still have the feeling that you're talking about how it is that we um, come to believe certain things about what's right and what's wrong. I'm, I'm, uh, that, this, this is a slightly different sort of thing than trying to determine what makes some things right and some things wrong. I mean, like if I were to say that uh, uh, killing innocent persons is wrong, and if you were to ask me why, and if I were to say, well, the reason is because uh, my parents say so. That, I don't think it would, anyone would be inclined to say that. Um, and, I, you know, I, and it doesn't seem it's in the same category as, for example, a social acceptance so it might, might appear to be. I mean, what is it that makes certain things right and certain things wrong? <coughs> well, it's a widespread view that we'll explore a little bit more detail in a moment. A widespread view says that what's right and wrong is uh, simply nothing other than what society says. That there isn't enough, anything more to it than that. What society says is definitive of the right. At least so goes that particular view. 
but other candidates. Are there other sorts of things that might determine the difference between right and wrong? It might actually be the thing that makes some things right and some things wrong. Yeah? Law. Law. That's uh, something like social command. One of the things that I put, one of the reasons I put command here uh, <coughs> Uh, in addition to just social acceptance is because I was sort of thinking about law. So I don't know if that's a different one. I mean, law is a social command. Yes? Possibly the standards that we've grown up with and the things that set precedent to it by the things that happen when we grew up with. I think we're stuck in social stuff. I mean, this still sounds like, so you mean so you mean to add some other things in the environment other than society itself? Yeah. So social and environmental circumstance might make some things right, some things wrong. Yes? Religion? Okay, let me put that down as a subcategory. We had other authorities. Parents was one. Let's say religious authorities <coughs> are another. Uh, I think we ought to give... God a category of his own. Now, I say that I'm not myself a believer in God, but it seems to me that God isn't just some other authority. Uh, when people understand um, rightness or wrongness to derive from God's command, it's not just because he's somebody big and powerful, it's because he's God. I mean, he's, some, he's a very, very special, powerful being, uh, the creator of the heavens and earth. And so for those people who believe in God, there is, a, uh, there is sometimes a, a, an inclination to think that, uh, that uh, well, the rightness and wrongness of, for example, the Ten Commandments derives from the fact that these are the commands of God. These are what God, the supreme authority in the universe, uh, demands of us. Let me take a moment, though, to, to sort of raise at least, at least raise in your minds an interesting puzzle that date ba dates back at least to Plato who wrote uh, some 2,300 years ago or so, and that's this. <clears throat> I mean, back then, Plato asked this question. Um, are the things that God commands right simply because God commands them? Or is it this way instead, that <clears throat> God only commands right things? Does that sound the same, or do you see the difference? I mean, let, here's, here's a way of understanding the difference. Let's say uh, God had commanded a different le list of things than, than people normally understand God to have, uh, to have uh, commanded. I mean, for example, let's say the, the Ten Commandments didn't say, uh, thou shalt not steal. Let's say it's st in that place in the Ten Commandments, instead there was one that said, steal as much as you can and as often as you can. Okay? Uh, and then the one about thou shalt not kill says, kill everybody you encounter, ever. I mean, let's say that the, com the commands were just different. I mean, if God had commanded that, which is very difficult to imagine under most people's conception of God, but had God commanded that, would those things then be right? Just because God commanded them. Well, I think some people will say yes, but other people will say, God wouldn't command those things. Those things are wrong revealing that, at least for those people who would say that, that God wouldn't and couldn't, or, or at least just wouldn't, have commanded those things, that there is some independent standard of rightness or wrongness. There's something else that makes things right and wrong that's identifiable so that we can know that God wouldn't have commanded those things. Now, again, there, there, it's possible to be on either side of that question, but the puzzle is an interesting one to contemplate. And I'll repeat the puzzle once again. Uh, are right things, are the things that God commands right because God commands them? Or is it that God only commands things that are right on some independent standard? That is a puzzle that we'll have to, would have to be confronted if we were to do justice to the, to the question of, uh, of uh, God being the authority uh, that is responsible for um, making some things right and some things wrong. Um, yes, what were you going to say? I can say the biological aspect, uh, something that's born in us that's innate. Um, not to kill would be something that's for, self, uh, for human preservation. That's, that's a very, 
a very interesting one. So let me put down instinct or something like that. Is that, is it, will that capture it? Yeah, sure. Like something, to not to, to kill yourself. There might be some kind of uh, uh, instinct that colors certain actions in certain ways and makes them at least more difficult to perform. We may have a natural uh, inclination to do certain kinds of things and a natural inclination away from them. It, indefinitely many different sorts of things might be proposed as being the factors that make right things right and wrong things wrong. And, and over the next uh, few lectures, I want to discuss some of the ones that have been most influential. And we've actually, we're looking at one or two of them here uh, among the things that you've suggested. Um, there are others that have been influential that you haven't suggested, but once I bring them up, I think, you know, they may seem, they may, they seem familiar to you because they're part of our culture. But let me start with the, uh, the point of view uh, that's listed here uh, as number two. Let me start with that one and, uh, and give it a name. We'll call this ethical relativism and we'll oppose it to absolutism after ethical after a couple of introductory remarks. First of all, um, these isms are, uh, they're kind of artificial. Um, we use ism categories all the time to describe people. Uh, we talk about uh, conservatism, liberalism, communism, capitalism, socialism, libertarianism. I mean, we talk about all of these things. We talk about other things that don't have ism at the end of them, but they're, they're similar. We talk about Christianity, Judaism, there's one, Islam. Uh, we talk about lots of different doctrines as if they were monolithic and clear and plain. But if you think about it, uh, in terms of things that are familiar, like political points of view or religious points of view, you'll realize that there's a tremendous amount of nuance within any one of these so-called isms. Uh, if I, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to sort of polarize the group, but if I were to ask here how many of you are liberals and you were to raise, and some, some of you would raise your hands. And if I were to ask how many of you are conservatives, another group would raise their hands. But we would by no means exhaust the crowd if I asked those two questions because perhaps the largest number might be people who are not really particularly interested in allying themselves with either of these two isms. They don't really wish to be captured by one of these pigeonholes. Um, uh, even for those who would be eager to raise their hand and identify th themselves as a this or a that or the other thing, I think uh, uh, all of us are familiar with the fact that uh, no two liberals really think exactly alike. No two conservatives think exactly alike. Even the people who bear the standards of political ideology or religious belief uh, disagree on many, many particulars of belief and of, of doctrine and of how things should be done. Um, that's the same uh, uh, case for these isms in philosophy. Uh, trying to uh, characterize a particular point of view as an ism is a, is a tricky business and a risky one. W what happens is you, you, you try and you sort of uh, uh, explain what seems to be the central core of relativism, for example, or absolutism, or egoism. Um, you may try to be fair, but um, uh, even if you are one yourself, you're not going to please everybody. Uh, that's, that's one thing. So that, uh, so that actually getting these things precise, accurate, and right so that they, they satisfy everyone, that's probably not in the cards. Um, Secondly, and this is a related point, um, you will notice that uh, conservatism will get characterized quite differently depending whether you're on the inside or the outside. Liberals know all about what conservatives think. Conservatives know all about what liberals think. At least so they say, so they believe. But when conservatives characterize liberals, liberals are not likely to recognize their view in the characterization and vice versa. So there's a lot of polemic that goes on. There's a, uh, and if, if, it's not, if it's not necessarily political polemic or if it's not necessarily trying to bring somebody round to a point of view, there's usually at least some method 
in any way at all of characterizing isms, whether they're political, philosophical, religion, religious, or whatever. Uh, teaching, pedagogy, has its own reasons for trying to structure things in a certain way. Uh, philosophers often find it useful to sort of contrast polar positions. Uh, and then people say, well, I'm sort of in the middle. So philosophers try to tighten it up and, and make the contrast in such a way so that you can't be in the middle. And that's part of what I'm going to do here. I'm going to try and define relativism and absolutism in a way that I hope is plausibly fair. But there's a method to the particular way I'm doing it. I'm going to do it in such a way so that you really can't fall between the two. You've got to make a choice. Okay, and that's easy enough to do, logically speaking, as I think you'll see. Um, ethical relativism is sometimes referred to as subjectivism also. And I'm going to avoid that particular term because, it, to me, it means something slightly different. Uh, especially since I want to call, uh, I want to break ethical relativism into a social and an individualistic subcategory. So let me do that right now. Ethical relativism, uh, I'm going to talk about at least two different versions. Social relativism and individualistic, individual, so for short, relativism. Now remember, uh, we're looking for theories or explanations of what it is that makes some things right and some things wrong. Both of these, eth these relativisms say that it has to do with belief. So first to social relativism. Social relativism says that whatever society says is right. The distinction between right and wrong is a distinction that has no meaning until there are social groups around. And then when social groups arrive at anything like a consensus. No one thinks there's unanimity on this, but when there is a, a fairly decent consensus within a social group, that actually creates right and wrong. So that social groups are the arbiters of right and wrong. Maybe nation states. That might sometimes be the case. That may be especially true when nation states are coextensive with cultural groupings. But in, in something like the United States, uh, where there, is, there are so many different cultures that have come to mix and blend and become something else which is perhaps slightly short of being a culture, uh, but which nevertheless has its own characteristics, um, there, in, in large populations and in countries like ours, it might not be so easy to say what society says about very many things. Cultures might have to be somewhat smaller than that. I'm not sure. But where there is consensus especially, there then emerges ca the categories of right and wrong. I mean, is this a, a familiar point of view that what, that what what is right and what is wrong is something that is determined socially. Furthermore, and this is important given the way I want to characterize relativism so as to set it off against absolutism. Furthermore, according to relativisms of both kinds, there's nothing more to be said about the, the matter. <coughs> There isn't something, like when, for example, when two cultures or societies disagree on a question of right or wrong, there isn't some deeper truth of the matter that one of them is right about and the other one is wrong about. What cultures say, or what societies say, makes right and wrong, constitutes right and wrong. Okay, for, so let me pause for a second and see if there's any need for clarification or any commentary. Yeah? So there's no um, 
there's no way to look at and see what made the people, the you know, social groups, have these views of right and wrong? It's usually uh, a question of uh, evolution. I mean, it's a historical question. I mean, uh, why do we have the views that we have now? Well, uh, the social relativist, I think, might be inclined to, to, to look for the uh, historical sources. I mean, how, how did we get these views? Well, let's go back and look and see what our views were like uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. If they were different 100 years ago, then uh, where did the change come in? But they would look more at the changing network of social belief in order to figure out what is right and wrong than they would anything else. There is, you know, I guess here's the, here's the contrast. Uh, for most people, I mean, there are actually exceptions to this as well, but for most people, um, it's possible that we are wrong about, for example, the existence of black holes out there in the universe. Or we might be wrong in thinking uh, that Mars has only two moons. I guess that's the number of moons that Mars has. I mean, it's possible that we might be wrong in that. Um, but there is a fact of the matter, quite independently of whatever we think. We might never know some facts about the universe. The universe is awfully big, after all. There might be all kinds of facts that no person, no mind will ever come to know. Um, at least no finite mind for those who think there is an all-encompassing mind that knows everything. Well, the, uh, that's, that's the way it is with uh, things like uh, numbers of stars, planets, existence of black holes and stuff. The relativist wants to contrast that kind, the ethical relativist wants to contrast that kind of situation with the situation in ethics. If no society thinks that X is wrong, then it just isn't. If any society thinks that X is wrong, then, according to social relativism, it is wrong in that society. And it's society's belief about this that makes it wrong. The individualist, let me just sketch this and I'll get back to you. The individualist relativism says something of the same thing except about individuals. Individualist relativism says there is no fact of the matter. Some things, I mean, I believe some things to be right. You and I may disagree about them. Uh, and um, and, the, thi you know, and, then, and that, the way to understand that is that uh, certain things are right for me but not for you. Uh, but if we were to say which things are right, period, we would be asking a meaningless question. The relativist would say uh, questions of right and wrong must be indexed to some society or another for the social relativists or must be indexed to some individual perspective or another in order to make sense. If we want to know if we got a controversy between two people about what's right and what's wrong, according to the relativist, uh, they might reach some sort of agreement. That would be important, but there is no fact of the matter about which they are arguing. There is nothing that is the truth or falsity of an ethical claim that compares with the truth or falsity of claims about the existence of black holes. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I just want you to. Actually, I should have what you said. So okay. <coughs> yeah. Um, on this uh, social relativism, yeah. um, say if you're an outside viewer and you have two societies and they have different um, views of what is right and wrong, mm -hmm. say like diet. So, so like what? It's something like diet. Say they had diet, two, diet, yeah, and and they say this is this is to live longer. But as an outside viewer, you can see the average lifespan each society's member, uh, well, the average lifespan of the different societies, can't you therefore say that this society's right? Well, this is closer, this is a lot closer to the 
do black holes exist question or how many planets does Mars have question. It's more, it seems more like what most people would understand as a factual question. Which diet actually does increase lifespan? We have information about that that the uh, people in the, uh, in the smaller groups might not have on your story. Uh, but this is not a moral or an ethical question. We're, that's supposed to be the distinction here. There are questions like that do have objective answers. Maybe one diet really does promote life while the other doesn't. Or, uh, and this is something that you, know, that you can get empirical, that is, uh, experimental evidence about. But the, the position of the relativists is, is that's precisely how ethical questions are different. There isn't a, a fact of the matter about which things are morally right and which things are, are morally wrong. What there is instead are just people's beliefs and opinions. And sometimes they correspond and sometimes they conflict. Um, I want to give you a story. I wish I had uh, prepared a little bit better. I want to give you a, 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 a typical kind of story that is uh, used I mean, uh, Evident, as evidence for social relativism especially. Uh, social relativism, I think, is a bit more widely espoused and believed in than ethical relativism, but both of them, are, than individual relativism. Both of them, though, are fairly popular, I think, uh, in the last half of the 20th century. But uh, uh, for social relativism, often the evidence is anthropological or sociological. I mean, uh, we will find out through, uh, through research that one group of people uh, have one set of customs, one set of standards about right and wrong, and then we'll go over here and we'll find out that this other group has a completely different set of standards about what's right and wrong. And uh, the deeper we dig, the harder it is to figure out what, you know, why we shouldn't just say they're both right. Um, I'll give you an example, except the example is, is only, it's, it's partly based on fact and partly me just trying to recreate something I remembered from a long time ago. I'm not exactly sure what the details are. I'm going to be talking about two, uh, two uh, tribes of, of Native Americans who had conflicting customs. I'm quite sure that if I, uh, if I had done my homework, I would have been able to tell you exactly which tribe was which, but that's what I get all confused about. I can never remember which tribe had which custom. So take this as just kind of a, 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 a sketch of a, a type of justification. I think it will seem familiar to you. Uh, there is some basis, in fact, for the things I'm about to say. But uh, don't walk away from here as if you've just been in an anthropology, or, uh, anthropology class, because you haven't. You haven't. You got this from a philosopher who's forgotten the, the, the particular specific details of the case. Uh, but I. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there, it, it, I'm not sure whether it was the Navajo, as I say, or the Arapaho, or the Apache, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to name two of these groups of Native Americans and uh, ascribe a, uh, differing customs to them in a particular matter. Um, the Navajo used to have the following uh, commitment and belief concerning what it was right to do if you were in a war party and one of your comrades was killed on your mission. For the Navajo, and remember, take all of this with a grain of salt as regards which tribe is which. For the Navajo, here's what you were supposed to do. If, if a warrior was lost, you're to ride back not to the village itself, but you're to ride back to a point within sight of the village. And there you are to make camp until the following morning. If you were to ride back into the village, this would be regarded as a gross insult to the memory of the dead, and indeed a gross insult to the family of the dead. Um, part of the custom, I guess, involved the fact that uh, what, the way the Navajo had things set up is whenever they saw a war party setting up camp and not coming in, they would know that a warrior was lost and they would then be able to make whatever preparations they had to make for the, for the, uh, for the ceremonies at dawn the next day. I mean, that, there was, so there was a practical function to this, but uh, 
given the whole network of the way that they did things, it was one of the worst and most um, egregious insults and the worst wrongs you could do to a person uh, was to ride, if you were in the war party, to, to disregard the, uh, the, uh, the custom and, and, and to ride back in immediately. For the Navajo, it was absolutely clear that what you were to do, the right thing to do, the only right thing to do, is to stay out there with inside of the village until dawn. And it was a terribly, terribly wrong thing, ethically, morally wrong, to ride back in immediately. Now, uh, that's clear enough. Down the road, let's say, uh, there was a, there's another tribe, the Arapaho, which didn't have this custom at all. For the Arapaho, if you lose a warrior while on a mission, you were to ride back in immediately. I mean, if you were to sit out there, I mean, if you were to you know, ride back in late in the afternoon of uh, one day and set up camp and just kind of lollygag out there with inside of the village and not come back in, you would be committing a tremendous insult to the memory of the dead and to the family of the dead warrior. Uh, the plain right thing to do among the Arapaho is to come back in fast and inform the community, inform the family so they know which person, which warrior it was that was killed and, uh, and, the, and the ceremonies would begin immediately. Um, so here we have a situation where with the Navajo, it's plain what's right and what's wrong. It's absolutely plain that it's right to stay out there with inside of the village. It's wrong to ride back in. For the Arapaho, it's just the opposite. It's wrong to stay out there with inside of the village, and it's right to ride back in. <coughs> now, so far, all we've been doing is talking about the beliefs of these two groups. Now the relativists focus in on the real issue. What is it that makes right things right and wrong things wrong? They ask this question. What on earth could you possibly mean if you wanted to know what should I really do? I mean, what should we really do? Forget about what the Navajo say and forget about what the Arapaho say. What is really right or wrong in this situation? In fact, what anybody can see who thinks about this, you don't have to be raised by the, the Navajo or by the Arapaho. You, I guess none of us were. But we can plainly see from whatever cultural background that we come from and whatever things we happen to think, I think it's obvious that if you're riding with the Navajo and if you know this custom, you should follow it. If you know what the expectations are, you should stay outside the village. And if you're riding, if you're in the Arapaho war party, if you or I, given our own cultural backgrounds, if we were riding with the Arapaho, what we ought to do, given knowledge of their customs, is we should, we should ride back in immediately. We shouldn't stay out there. I mean, it's like this. I mean, there are actually people in the world who I understand uh, whose cultures make it something of an insult if you stick out your hand, as we always do, to shake. This is regarded as something of an insult. Now, it's easy to make mistakes, but if you know that, if you know that, and if you're talking to somebody who's from that culture, and perhaps someone who doesn't, isn't familiar with our culture, if you know all this, and you sit there and say, well, I know this person is going to be insulted if I stick out my hand, and then you stick out your hand, I mean, surely you've done something that's wrong. Now, again, mistake. if you don't know the custom, that's different. You're, no, you're not culpable for that unless you're, there's some particular reason why you really should have known. But so the ethical relativist says, look, this is, this is the sort of case that's common. Uh, what, you know, conventions about what's right and what's wrong, are, um, are, uh, they vary from culture to culture. And there really does, it doesn't make sense to ask what's, what's the truth. You can only answer that. When with the Navajo, one ought to do this. When with the Arapaho, one ought to do that. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. And that's all there is to it. And that's social relativism. OK, comments, questions, objections, anything? Yes? Um, about the hand thing? 
I mean, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a good idea to look into deeper into why they feel that's an insult. Like maybe there's I'm just like speaking very hypothetically. What if there's like some kind of disease you can pass? Well, there are reasons why the, the, that particular custom is the way it is, and I'm not going to go into it right now, but there are reasons as to why uh, the cultures that I'm familiar with uh, who, uh, who don't like it if you reach out your hand toward them, why they take that as an insult. Uh, and it is important to understand these things. Why? I, I, what I'm interested in is not that particular cult culture, but why is it important to look into that? Well, because you'll frequently find out, or you may frequently find out, that the custom is not arbitrary. It's not some kind of whim that's just been cooked up for no reason at all. It has some kind of, it makes sense, given an historical background, or given a cultural background, or an institutional setting, or a, 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 it, within the, a certain kind of practice. So. Um, one good reason for trying to ask why it is that, uh, that people have the particular customs that they do is that it might turn out that it's not nearly so arbitrary as it may seem. And it isn't just, just a belief, it's a belief that has a rationale to it that can be understood. That's ethical relativism, at least in its social variety. I'm not going to deal too much with individual relativism. Uh, I will pose to you a challenge, though, and ask you to see if you can uh, solve, solve the puzzle. Ethical absolutists are people who, the way I want to characterize them for these purposes, is they all can be lumped under a big head. There's lots and lots of different kinds of absolutists who think this, who think that, who think the other thing. But the thing that's common among them is that they disagree with the relativist as regards the basis for right and wrong, in particular this business about <coughs> right and wrongs being a function of belief. The absolutists, by and large, say not entirely a function. What's right and what's wrong is not simply dependent upon what cultures or individuals or what anyone else thinks or believes. There is something more. And then, as I say, there's millions of different kinds of absolutists under this characterization. They disagree about what the something more is. But what they all agree on is it's not just beliefs. Just because a society says that something's right, that doesn't make it right. Just because an individual says that something's right, that doesn't make it right. Questions of right and wrong are not entirely determined by social or individual or any other kind of belief. Now, now that you have the, you know the definition that I'm using of ethical absolutism, I want to say something that here's the puzzle uh, that might uh, seem a little bit peculiar. The ethical, absolutism, ethical absolutist not only would not think that this little story about the Navajo and the Arapaho or any other such story, not only does it not demonstrate relativism or undermine absolutism, the absolutist thinks that within this story is really good support for absolutism. How? How can the absolutists think that? I mean, here we've got two cultures that differ. They're opposites on what they think is right and what's wrong. And indeed, it's hard to see what other kind of question there could be about what really is right and wrong. I mean, what really should you do? How can the absolutist think that that story supports absolutism, the view that something else is going on beyond belief? Well, that's the key. I mean, that is one way of putting the, the whole uh, 
if I understand what you're saying, uh, the, the whole absolutist complaint, it's that while at this one level they certainly do disagree, they disagree about what should you do when you're in the war party and you need to, uh, uh, and, you, and you've lost the warrior, but they seem to agree on the real ethical principle, namely, you must not show disrespect to the memory of the dead. You must not insult the memory of the dead. You must not insult the family of the dead. They seem to agree on this. We seem to be prepared to agree to that ourselves as we think about this case. And all that the two tribes disagree upon is what the absolutists would regard as a relatively trivial, superficial detail. Namely, which things constitute insults. And if you were to look into that, the absolutist might argue, you would find, just as you suggested, that there might be different background circumstances that explain why <coughs> this thing counts as an insult in this tribe, but doesn't count as an insult in that tribe. But those are relatively trivial, I think the absolutist would say, non-ethical circumstances. These are differences in custom. So in that particular case, anyway, it would appear that there is, uh, is not the kind of night and day disagreement about matters of ethics as might have appeared in the way I told the story at first. There's night and day differences about practices, but the underlying ethical principle is the same. Indeed, it's the principle that explains why you shouldn't move, uh, you know, ride back in as far as the Navajo are concerned and why you shouldn't stay out as far as the Arapaho are concerned. It also explains why we, third parties, ought to follow the practices of the tribes when we're, when we're in the particular war parties. It's because you shouldn't insult the memory of the dead, and these are the things that constitute insults. So that's one thing. And then the absolutist might point out another thing. Again, I'm going to just sketch these things, and I, I want to re-emphasize re what I emphasized at the beginning. Um, I don't want to make it appear as if ethical relativism or any of the other isms that I'm going to discuss over the next few lectures are vanquished by, uh, by the things that I'm saying. They're not. Indeed, a good social relativist would have lots of things to say in response to, to the argument that I've just made. But I'm not going to spend our lives going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, because that's precisely what could be done. I am going to try to move forward. I, I wanted to present ethical relativism and each of the subsequent views uh, in a fairly plausible way, a fairly convincing way, and then show, at least raise, a problem with them which will allow us to move forward. So I don't want to make you think that, um, that we've uh, crushed relativism and are now moving on to another view, but indeed, uh, all I want to do is to show you uh, what reasons people have, might have for rejecting relativism. And then that will allow us to move on to the next thing I want to talk about. But um, the, another argument that absolutists might make is this, or at least an observation. This isn't so much an argument as, a, as, a, as an observation, and that's this. That uh, far from uh, being remote, isolated, incomprehending, uh, far from having radically different values, cultures isolated in time and in space, uh, cultures are remarkable for their similarity. That it's always possible to emphasize the differences between individuals or the differences between cultures. But the, but the similarities are also incredible, and focusing attention on those will cast doubt on the idea that what's right and what's wrong is simply determined by society's decision, by social whim, by individual preference, or anything of the like. I mean, for example, we're able to read the literatures of cultures long dead, isolated from us in time. We're able to read written down versions of uh, sagas, myths, uh, uh, stories, uh, religious and, uh, and cosmological theories of people's who themselves have uh, not existed for thousands and thousands of years. We're able to read these things, and they're often cast in terms of stories. They may be isolated not only in time, but in place. I mean, we can read stories of peoples who live on isolated islands in the middle of the Pacific. 
And yet, we can recognize, for the, for, for the most part, we can recognize who the heroes are and who the villains are. We can tell you know, which are the evil things that get done in these stories and which are the very good things. And there are some interesting differences. We're sometimes surprised to find some of the things that are celebrated in ancient stories. But there's also remarkable resemblances. So uh, I guess this point, this observation, suggests that it's easy to overmake the case that different cultures have different ethical standards. And it's easy to underestimate the similarity from culture to culture. And I'd say also, since I want to be fair at least, or at least you know, keep reminding us that there's also, also individual uh, relativism, we also probably overestimate the differences between individuals and underestimate the commonality. And then lastly, as a strategic matter, this isn't an argument or an observation, but just a strategic matter, um, ethical relativism has the advantage, has the positive feature of expressing um, a tolerant attitude toward people whose views are different from our own. I mean, ethical relativism is probably born of uh, a social desire not to get into fights with people. I mean, we, want, we, say, we say about religions, you know, we want to try and let people have their own religions. Let's not fight about them. But similarly, I think for most of us, we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to badger people about their morality. I mean, they, got a, uh, they have different views about what's right and wrong than ours. So be it. I don't want to bother them. I don't want, I don't want to be a, uh, you know, a, a, a preacher. Um, we ought, I mean, there's a general premise that we ought to be tolerant of the different views of others. And they, in turn, ought to be tolerant of ours. Now, as a side point, um, there's an interesting question to ask about whether that is an absolute ethical assertion or whether it only derives its ethical force from the fact that certain numbers of people believe it. But forget that for now. This is an advantage, a, a good feature of relativism. It, it expresses tolerance. But on the other side of it, if there really isn't anything deeper about which people who disagree could be talking about, if there isn't any truth of the matter, then on matters that are, are of a very uh, great importance to us, all we can do once we've exhausted our efforts to convince one another is to beat each other over the heads. Now, there's, a, there's a real um, danger that if all there are are different people's beliefs and if there's nothing that we share that, that, that can help us get around our differences, um, if we are committed to the idea that there's nothing deeper, just, there's just different people's beliefs, then when those beliefs really count, it may very well be that there's no resort other than violence. Whereas the absolutist urges us, you know, strategically now, that surely wherever it may seem that we have disagreements about some things, we can find other things, perhaps at a deeper level of abstraction, that we do agree upon that will help lead us out of our disagreements. So strategically, the absolutist uh, might justifiably make the claim that, uh, that uh, even if absolutism weren't 100 percent correct, it's a, it's a good policy. Yeah? As far as uh, ethical relativism, is there even a desire to find out what is right and wrong? Or is it just taking what is the... As far as relativists are concerned? Yeah, excuse me, relativists. I mean, you know, there's 10 million cultures. Well, it depends, you know, I, I, I can't speak for relativists generally. Uh, the uh, case is often made quite descriptively. Uh, the case is often made just uh, in terms of uh, observing that cultures have these differences. And also observing that there isn't any clear way to see beyond the differences to, to a commonality. But, uh, um, 
I, as far as, if one is really an ethical relativist, a social relativist, then I think one is committed to the view that there isn't anything to, to, to search for. Yeah. So there isn't any such quest. There isn't anything to search for. You, you, you try to, if, if tribes are, I mean, what you can do is to try to find ways for individuals or groups to compromise with one another, to work out their differences. You could try to do that. But uh, if this, is all, this is all a matter of, uh, of practicality. There isn't, there, isn't, there isn't a question for the relativist of getting at the truth of the matter. You know, on the, on the other hand, is the absolutist, I mean, does he break it down that if everyone murders each other, there'll be no one left? You know, that, that kind of functional thing. Um, uh, is there any, you know, argument in that? I mean, to the, uh, yeah, the, I, think, uh, the, I think you're right to be suspicious of both sides uh, in terms of their uh, opposition to the other. There's, there's, uh, the, uh, what, what relativism has provided us with uh, is um, very important information about the real differences that there are among cultures and, um, and some real good evidence to uh, move absolutists off what used to be, or what often has been part of their position, but which no longer is so much anymore, uh, namely that, uh, uh, that you could actually list the things that are right or wrong. Absolutists char characteristically, and I want to make sure that this is clear as well, absolutists don't necessarily believe they know which things are right and which things are wrong. Their commitment is very much like the commitment of the scientist. I mean, they believe that there is an answer to these questions, but they don't necessarily believe that they know what the answer is. They are just negating the idea that all there is to ethics is, a, is beliefs or pronouncements. Um, another piece of data or another uh, uh, hint that uh, uh, absolutists may use to suggest that there's got to be more than belief here has to do just with the logic of the way we talk and think about ethics. I mean, think about this. If it were true that, um, that what societies say makes things right, that whatever society says is by definition right, well, then that makes it definitionally and logically impossible for a society ever to be wrong about anything. So it becomes simply impossible for societies ever to be mistaken in an ethical claim. And uh, for individual relativism, it's even less problem, uh, plausible. It's even more of a problem. It would mean neither you nor I nor anyone else can be wrong. I mean, if what makes something right is that I think it. If just believing something to be right makes it right, then it's impossible for me to be mistaken in my beliefs. So I can never be wrong. I can never be mistaken in thinking that something's right or wrong. And it becomes ridiculous, it becomes technically wrong for, even, for me to even say, well, I used to think that such and such was wrong, but I was mistaken. That becomes logically impossible on, on, on individualist relativism. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just an understanding what definitions do. I mean, if we, or what, not just definitions, but if, if uh, If the, determin the determining factor in deciding whether something's right or wrong is that somebody or some group believes it, if that's the determining factor, if that just simply makes things right, then those groups and individuals or whatever can't be wrong because they're believing it makes it right. And that seems really weird. It's a funny way to talk. I mean, it would seem odd to say societies can't be wrong in uh, their judgments about uh, what's right and what's wrong, or that individuals can't be. It doesn't seem to be the way, it doesn't seem to work very well with the way we think about these things. Or common, not the way, I mean, the, the, you, can, you can wend your way through these problems and make it all consistent and make it all work out. But it's, uh, you have, it's uncomfortable. At least so the absolutists would argue.
I'm revealing to a certain extent, uh, probably to a great extent, that I'm more partial myself to ethical absolutism than to, than to relativism. But only in the version that says there really is something that we're agonizing over when we're trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. It's not a futile exercise. It would be a futile exercise. It would be absolutely ridiculous for us to agonize over what's right or what's wrong if indeed what's right and what's wrong simply was what society says, or worse, if it was what we said. It would be nothing to agonize over in the latter case. In the former case, all we'd have to do is I mean, just consult a poll. If we want to know what's right, just take a poll. Have a vote. And if we get a you know, substantial majority for one view, ah, then we'll know that's right. But that seems very, uh, that doesn't really seem fit with my understanding of ethics, morality, or, uh, or right and wrong. And uh, whereas it might, with some of yours, um, that I hope it, that explains a little bit why I'm uh, more partial to ethical absolutism, at least as I've characterized it, than I am to relativism. The absolutist may be, uh, may not only acknowledge but insist, this is another thing that might confuse you and I want to clarify it, might insist that in order to tell which thing really is objectively right in a particular circumstance, you'll really have to know all kinds of details <coughs> about the circumstances. I mean the absolutist may not think and probably won't think, if, they, if they're uh, uh, reasonably sophisticated in this, that um, there's some list of things that you should never, ever, ever, ever do under any circumstances. I mean, there might be some things like that, but you have to define them. And you, know, you have to go out of your way to make sure you've covered all kinds of possible uh, qualifying instances in order, in order to make the statement. But uh, for example, it's probably not likely that uh, the absolutist would, uh, would contend uh, that you should never ever lie. Indeed, it seems to me reasonable that there might be circumstances which uh, not only allow, uh, make it okay to lie, but might require it. For example, uh, not betraying someone hiring, uh, hiding from an ax murderer. I mean, if you can, you know, if the axe murderer comes up and says, hi, I'm an axe murderer. Um, I'm looking for a person with red hair, just uh, ran by here. Uh, if you can you know, lie and not, and not instruct, I mean, uh, instruct the person, that might not only be OK, but maybe an obligation of yours. <coughs> kind of a simplistic case. But uh, uh, it's ethical re relativists probably more than anybody else who have pointed consistently to the need to take, in, uh, take circumstances into consideration. Absolutists, I think, are in a position to agree. The only remaining serious disagreement is on whether there's anything beyond the beliefs of society or of, uh, of individuals uh, that are determinative of right and wrong. Now, uh, having said that absolutists think there's more to it than just beliefs, question arises like what? What more? And so what I'm going to begin with, and we'll finish up uh, today's session uh, with, is a, a brief introduction to a, a view called ethical egoism, which uh, moves only slightly uh, into the realm of absolutism. It is an absolutist theory because it does not think that people, that what's right and what's wrong is determined strictly by what people believe. But it is, it is relativized to individuals. Is anyone familiar with the view? If so, let me know what it is. If not, guess. What's ethical egoism? Remember, it is a theory about what makes the difference between right and wrong. What makes right things right? What makes wrong things wrong? Yeah? Maybe what uh, one person thinks is the ultimate way to be, like the ultimate right or wrong, that one person he feels everyone else should do the same? Well, let's see. First of all, it's not a relativistic theory, it's an absolutist theory, so it's not going to be based on what anybody thinks. Um, 
that's, there's, there's only one source for what's right or wrong. What? Just one thing, not, not specified? Like, like God? Now, egoism, what does that evoke? What is this word here? Ego. Self. Self. So that's going to have, so the idea of self is going to play a role here. Um, maybe like somebody believes that what they think is the only way. Does it rely on thought? Remember, it's not a relativist position. It doesn't say that we should do those things that so-and-so thinks. It doesn't even say, as you might guess, that what each person, what, what makes, uh, what's right for each person is whatever they think is right. That's not the view. It doesn't rely on what people think. But it is egoistic. It is self-oriented. Yeah? Whatever you do is right? No. Nope. It's possible to do things that are wrong on this view. Personal self-standards and self-morals. That's what people think. We're back on, on focusing on what people think. I'll try one more. Experience? No. Uh, what's right for each person is what's in that person's best interests. If we want to know what's the right thing to do, it is what is in our own best interests. Is anyone familiar with the author Ayn Rand? Ethical egoist, par excellence. Uh, Rand has written a number of either delightful or infuriating books, depending on the reader. Um, no one, I think, in the world who's ever read Rand's books is in between. It's either <laughs> they like, they love her, or they're infuriated by her. Uh, a number of books, novels and nonfiction alike, all of which explore the theme of ethical egoism. One of the nonfiction books, in fact, is called The Virtue of Selfishness. The, uh, the fiction books, I don't know whether you, you'll uh, recognize their titles. The earliest one's called We the Living. That's usually not recognizable. But the later ones, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, or have been available on, uh, on bookshelves in almost any bookstore you can walk into, even you know, in drugstores. These books have been available on bookshelves, in the case of Fountainhead, since 1941, constantly, and in the case of Atlas Shrugged, since 1956. I mean, she's got to be one of the best-selling authors there ever has been. Uh, if uh, I had a recommend recommendation to make, as regards the novels in general, We the Living is just kind of an interesting novel. Uh, Rand herself, that's not her original name, Rand is uh, an immigre from the Soviet Union. She left with her family when she was, I think, in her early 20s, in the 1920s, and she has a great hatred and loathing for communism, socialism. Another of her titles is called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. She understands herself to be preaching the virtues of capitalism as an ethic, not just as an economic system. But the We the Living is interesting because it talks about, uh, it's a novel that talks about <coughs> her perception of life in the Soviet Union, and also the battle of ideas. She's always got heroes in her book. She loves heroes. The Fountainhead is, is, is also very well written. It uh, begins to explore ethical egoism uh, uh, a good deal more carefully. It's about uh, an architect named Howard Rourke. It's a very, very nice novel. Atlas Shrugged is the one that she regarded as her great work. Uh, it's something like a 1,000 pages long. It's really quite brilliant and wonderful. Uh, if you start reading it, I think you will be taken by it, and you will read right on through, whether, again, you hate it or love it. Um, there is, in the middle someplace, a 90-page radio speech that sometimes stops people dead in their tracks. But apart from that, there's a lot of action. That's a good book as well. But uh, she is an ethical egoist. She thinks what people ought to do is what's in their own best interests. She thinks the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity 
may be altruism, whether in its Christian form or its communist form. She lumps them together. She says they both say that, that wealth and, and, and well-being and individual happiness are awful, that you ought to give it all away to the poor. They're both alike. She just lumps them together. And she thinks, uh, uh, and she offers reasons for that. It's not just claims she makes, but uh, her egoism suggests that uh, what people really ought to do is to explore their own best interests. Um, now, let me ask you what you suspect she would think about the following dilemma, because this is one I know she's written about. This will help you see some of the intricacies of ethical egoism. Let's say a woman has the following options. She has a certain number of dollars, and she can either buy a hat that strikes her fancy, or she can feed her child. Which ought she to do, according to the egoist? Why would you think that? I'm going to try and be Ayn Rand here. Actually, I have to speak with a Russian accent. I'm not going to try that. But why would you think, buy the hat? It's in her self-interest. Do you think so? Is that what's in that woman's best self-interest? Buy the hat rather than feed the child? Is that so clear? How are you understanding the woman's interests? Well, selfish you should. I mean, selfish should be self-oriented. She should be doing the things that she values most highly and which really are in service of her long-term best interest. Well, there's a variety of things that could be said about, said in favor. I mean, the hat would seem, I mean, Rand thought that would be uh, amazing. I mean, what kind of a person would, would spend money on the hat? I mean, this is an idiot, <laughs> Rand would argue. I mean, this is, I mean, that's clearly not in anybody's self-interest. I mean, what kind of, a hat is a triviality. The kid, first of all, for Rand, now, not, you might think that, first of all, the egoist would consider, oh, well, the kid might then grow up and support me in my old age, or et cetera. You know, I think that, that they, they, they think like that. That's not the way Rand thinks. He said, where are this woman's values if she buys the hat? I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a life. This is her child. Um, her interest, or a parent's interest, to a certain extent, is in the child, by and large. What kind of, and then if you were to talk about, uh, imagine that people would lead cold, calculating lives where they try to find their self, you know, try, you know, try to figure out, all right, what's in my best interest here in every situation? Uh, I don't know what Rand would say, but an egoist is at least in the position of being able to say, look, is that in a person's best interest to be a pers person like that, constantly calculating, never close to anybody, never uh, uh, enjoying um, uh, intimacy, never enjoying uh, 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 the kind of benevolence that's born of real love, whether of, uh, of, of, of lovers or of children or of whatever? I mean, is that really what's in a person's, I mean, is, is money, hats, is that the sorts of things that are really in a human being's best interest? It gets complicated trying to figure out what's in a person's real best interest. It might be that benevolence, all the normal standard positive moral traits, it might be that all of them could be defended on the basis of self-interest. Not just because they'll pay off in the long run, but they may pay off immediately. It might be that being a generous person, a loving person, a caring person, just might m help you enjoy your life better from day to day, not just down the road when someone comes along and helps you in return. Now, that's at least a possible way of looking at these things. So I want to point out in saying that, that ethical egoism, while it focuses attention on the self, it says what's right is what is in a person's long-term best interest. It need not close off considerations that are uh, not plainly self-oriented. Indeed, almost anything that you and I think of as right or wrong could at least in principle be defended as right or wrong on egoist grounds. 